Do you think Jesus could do anything right here in Las Vegas, Sin City? I believe that what God is doing is he's creating an eternal testimony. And what we know is when we can come together under a spirit of unity, nothing will be impossible. Hello and welcome to another episode of Las Vegas United. I'm your host, Pastor Aaron Pino, and I am so excited that you've taken some time out of your schedule to come here and to see what God is doing here in Las Vegas. You know, here at Las Vegas United, we are partnering with God to create an eternal testimony of his goodness, mercy, and power right here in the Las Vegas Valley. And uh, today I am extremely excited because I have a very special near and dear guest to my heart, and to my life, uh, my very own pastor right here in Las Vegas. You might say, well, Pastor Aaron, aren't you a pastor? Yes, I am a pastor, but I believe that a pastor needs a pastor. And so today I have my very uh, near and dear friend, my pastor, Pastor David Childers. Pastor David, thank you for being on the show today. It's my privilege, Pastor Aaron. It's oh. exciting to be here. Yes, yes. I'm I'm I am glad to have you here today. I'm glad to uh talk with you and let our audience be exposed to the greatness <laughs> extraordinaire oh my. <laughs> of the one and only David Childers, <laughs> the Pope of Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm joking around with the Pope thing, but for real, I mean, you, you've been such a blessing to my life, my family's life over the years. So uh, it is an honor and a privilege to have you here today and to let our audience get to know you a little bit more. And so um, with that being said, tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, your family, ministry, uh, all that good stuff. Well, uh, my family moved here in 1962. Las Vegas was a community of 68,000 people. Wow. Uh, I was four years old. Uh, they made me drive the van. I don't know about that. That was <laughs> a terrible situation. So we, we arri arrived in Las Vegas July 25th, 1962. And uh, my dad, uh, who's a pastor as well, as you know, mm -hmm. Pastor Paul. Yes. Um, he said, well, we'll be here six months. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are 60 years later wow and uh man it's uh it's been a privilege to be in las vegas and i uh started uh preaching when i was 16 years old mm -hmm. and uh, a brother by the name of brad staley who had just been working at uh, then kila radio station he uh he was my worship leader. He was 19, I was 16, and and we built a youth group in my dad's church. Yeah. And uh, then one thing led to another, and there's plenty of stories I could tell along the way, but this is a, our, <laughs> our show, so. <laughs> it's actually only 30 minutes, so. We, 30 minutes. Well, yes, I, sir. I can get to 1969, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, then uh uh, the Lord called me to ministry when I was 16, started preaching. And uh, from there, I uh, went to Bible college at Vanguard University in Costa Mesa for three years. Uh, never intended to come back to Las Vegas. Mm. But uh, the Lord, you know, the Lord uh, has ways of convincing you to go. And, <laughs> and February of uh, 19, let's see, when did I graduate? 1985. Uh, it's 27, almost 27, 27 when we moved back. Uh, we, I bought a car, a new car, uh, my last year of last semester of college. And it was navy blue with black interior. And my wife says, well, what if we move back to Las Vegas? I said, we'll never do that. <laughs> she goes, but what if? I said, promise, I promise you we're not going back to Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, so then, then uh, what happened is... Uh, and uh, I graduated in May, and, and by uh, September, we're loading up the, the truck and moving back to Vegas. Wow. And I started a church in 1985. Uh, my dad was 71. I was 27. Our first service, we had 10 people, mm. and four of them was our own family. And in, in my dad's living room at 
6840 South Polaris, which you can't find anymore because the 215 freeway exit right. has taken care of that. And That's right. Uh, anyway, eventually I uh, went to Bible college. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I already came back from Bible college. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I need an editor for my own life. But <laughs> so anyway, um, started in 1985. Mm. And so in two months, uh, I'll have pastored here 37 years. Incredible. So Incredible. I know a little something about perseverance. That's right. You sure do. And I mean, Pastor Paul, he he pioneered as well. Yes, he pioneered uh, one church in 1972. It was called Mountain View Assembly of God. Mm -hmm. Later, it got changed to, um, well, I forget what it got changed to. But Champion right, Center. Right now, it's the Champion yeah. Center. It was changed to something else prior to that. Oh, okay. No, no, it wasn't. It was the Champion Center that it got changed to. That's right. Yeah. Wow. You, you the, the longevity and history in our city uh is incredible i know you and i have sat down many times and uh we won't say where but we've had lunch places yes and uh <laughs> we don't tell it where it is because we don't want there to be a line out the door next time we get there you exactly know? they won't let us in <laughs> <laughs> but sitting down the many times you know one one of the things that you and i have talked about is longevity and perseverance a testimony in my opinion, is 37 years in ministry. You know, statistically speaking, uh, they say 10, 10, only 10% 10 of people who start out in the ministry out of Bible school, only 10% of them make it to what they would consider retirement age. Uh, so there's 90% of people who just fall off. They maybe start, uh, but pastoring, ministries gotten to them, maybe family issues. And here you are, 37 years is an incredible testimony. And we've talked about the longevity. So talk to myself and our audience a little bit more about what it takes to persevere. Well, first of all, uh, about every month, there is a good, good reason to resign. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to uh, learn how to uh, persevere through difficult times. And um, it uh, is an act of the will. Mm. If you follow your feelings, you'll be out of the ministry. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, usually those feelings that are negative, uh, not always usually, but always the negative feelings will take you out of ministry. They'll take you away from God. Mm. And you've got to learn how to take authority over those negative feelings and replace them with the emotions God wants us to have, which is love, joy, and peace. Those mm -hmm. are the big three. And uh, so it was shocking to me when the Lord revealed that we can choose our emotions. I said, what? <laughs> I said, you're kidding me. He goes, well, the Holy Spirit goes, no, you can choose to have the emotions. And so you've got to get control of your emotions. And uh, so many people don't. And, and then, you know, uh, difficult times happen. Uh, half the people that you do great things for are going to turn on you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then you get to find out if you've done it for the Lord yeah. or if you've done it for them or some other reason. Uh, and so the answer better always be that you're going to do it for the Lord. Uh, that's the key. Yeah. Doing it for the Lord. Uh, and, you know, if you knew they were going to turn on you, would you have done the good deed anyway? The answer would better be yes, because you didn't do it all for them. You did it all for the Lord. That's right. And so keeping your uh, emotions in check is a big deal. Uh, having godly emotions. I'm writing a book on uh, emotional holiness. Yeah. Which is a term the Lord gave me. Anyway, uh, uh, so longevity comes along also when you're able to get your eyes off of man and circumstances and keep them focused on the Lord, which is done through praise and worship. Yes. And uh, you got to mm. be a worshiper to be great in God. Well, yes, you do. And so that's part of the secret. And, yeah. and then sometimes it's just old grit. Where you take yourself, <laughs> take yourself by the shirt of the collar and say, you know, you're going to stick around. You're going to stay. Yeah. And that doesn't just apply to ministry. That implies to life. Yes. That implies to being a husband, being a wife, being yes. uh, a Christian. Yes. I mean, this is... This is uh, to a certain degree, universal. I mean, it's not just for us who are in ministry dealing with people, but I mean, 
serving the Lord, uh, you got to have grit to do that too. You have to, you have to, uh, take on these things, the love, peace, and joy. Like you said, you can choose your emotions, even whenever you go through things, whether it's, uh, letting go, being let go from your job or having your house flooded, uh, <laughs> which I know a thing or two about that, you know, <laughs> yes. um, but it's, it's choosing those things. And there's so many ways I want to go with this conversation, but we don't have enough time. Well, we'll have to come back next time. Yes, talk you again. will. <laughs> um, one thing you talk about praise and worship, you know, I remember uh, growing up in your church as a boy. Uh, to give context to this, my parents were at your church, I think, maybe seven years or so. I don't remember the entire timeline, but we moved here whenever I was three years old. We experiment with a couple different churches that we land up over at Spring Valley Assembly of God, 7570 Peace Way. I still remember the address. Good job. Oh, thank you. Part of that is because whenever we moved back to Vegas, I sent all my mail to you guys. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. I, I go, What's this church? Oh, that's Aaron's church. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I remember, I remember uh, being there at the church, and I remember even as a little boy, experiencing the presence of God yes. in the services and being exposed to worship, even whenever I didn't have a bearing for that, I didn't have a way to tell you what I was feeling or experiencing. And even after I went through my rebellion stage, through my teenage years uh, and coming back to the Lord when I was 18, those were some anchoring moments for me as a young person in the services, which now it's Peaceway Christian Center, but before it's Spring Valley, experiencing the presence of God. And I remember you being behind the pulpit with the lavalier mic that came out of the uh, the pulpit, leading us in praise and worship. And the praise and worship, the worship really happened in between the songs. I remember you would yeah. sing out to the Lord from your heart, sing in the spirit and you know, nowadays people, all young people would say, oh, that's just so old school. No, listen, that is powerful. <laughs> that is where we got exposed. So talk to us a little bit about the power of praise and worship in regards to the longevity of you you walking things out. Well, uh, the third, third book uh, that I hope to write, and please no one that's listening, try to steal the title. <laughs> <laughs> Or I'll have to forgive you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> which is another book that you have out. Yeah, uh, yeah it's called Worship Warfare. Mm. And uh, the premise that the Lord gave to me is that when we engage in worship, we are engaging in spiritual warfare. Mm. And uh, and so then I, you know, look at the life of young David. Mm -hmm. You know, what's a kid supposed to do when he's out wa watching the sheep? And he'd probably been there since he was probably 10. I don't have any biblical proof for that, but I'm just kind of guesstimating. That, mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, what's there to do out there with the sheep? There was no telephone. There was no cell phone. There was no iPads, iPods, no TV, no, TV, no radio, nothing. And so uh, David began to invest in two things, throwing rocks, which comes natural to kids. And if you've ever been in Israel, you know that there's little pebbles and rocks everywhere. And I guesstimate that he threw about 300 a day mm. and he did it for five or six years. So that's close to half a million throws. So much so that when he faced Goliath, he came with a gun uh, and Goliath yeah. came with a spear mm. and a sword. Mm. And, uh, and so he was a warrior. And um, so what happened is the other time he began to worship God. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, out of, out of, um, 500 or 600,000 teenage boys and young men in Israel. God chose this kid that was watching sheep, so they thought, as the next king, because he was a worship warrior. Mm. And uh, God looked at his heart. Now, he knew that he was going to have a failure with Bathsheba. Sure. But the Bible still records that the only, the only person that uh, says that a man after God's own heart was King David. That's right. And uh, so there, you know, I looked at that. And then, of course, Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20, uh, he sent the worship team out ahead of the army. Oh, 
yeah. <laughs> and the, that was the men's worship team. Bad time to be on the men's worship team. And they had their <laughs> hands raised up. The Hebrew says the word for uh, either yada or toda. And they're saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. But they're going to be the first on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And if God doesn't show up. And they weren't just humming a few bars there. They were singing with everything because their worship was their warfare. Yes, yes, yes. And then it says, as they begin to sing in praise, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God set the ambush. Mm. And so uh, I want to encourage people to be worshipers. And I've taken Revelations chapter 4 and 5 and taken only the worship words, 146 worship words, and I combine them all together. And I just tell people to speak them out loud or eventually sing them. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Yes, and yes, yes. Man, when that begins to happen, you get your focus off of yourself, which leads to mental illness, might I add. <laughs> <laughs> and onto God, which brings emotional mm. health. Mm. And so if you're looking at your problem, your circumstances, your environment, you're always going to struggle. But mm -hmm. if you're going to look to worshiping God and putting him in his rightful place, for some reason, he gets blessed and begins to move miracles into our life. Uh, I can't explain it, except I've been able to observe it. Yeah. So worship warfare is paramount for staying in ministry and for living the victorious Christian life. That's right. That's right. Uh, one one thing I want you to talk about, too, because um, worship has plays a part in this. Uh, you, you, t you tell me a story whenever you first started the church. And you would go and you'd have morning coffee at your favorite coffee shop in Las Vegas, McDonald's. <laughs> well, that, I was very young, so you'll have to excuse me for that. <laughs> hey, McDonald's actually has pretty good coffee, you know. Yeah. Oh, no, you're right. It does. It has and, pretty, and a buck a cup for a large. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't beat, beat that. that. Um, but you would say that you, you would sit there and the demon would come and visit you and tell you, you can't do this. Yeah, yeah. You can't succeed. You'll never make it. Right. So talk talk to us. We have, we have eight minutes to talk about this, but I want you to talk to that story. Because what that whenever you told me that story, what that did in me is that built faith in me. And that let me know that stuff is going to come at me. But if I persevere through it. I'm going to be all right. Tell, tell, talk to us about that story. Well, uh, let's see. We were still in our storefront. So this would have been uh, 1987. We just started our second service, the early service. And I would actually drive my car to the same McDonald's on Spring Mountain and Redwood, I want to say, pretty close to Jones. And uh, my, when my tires had hit the, the pavement of McDonald's, a demon of fear came against me. Mm. And said this, you're never going to make it. Uh, there won't be enough money. There won't be enough people. So why don't you just quit right now? Wow. And uh, and I knew enough about spiritual warfare that I knew I was being attacked. That the thoughts that I, I was having weren't my thoughts. They were uh, demonically induced. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm parking the car, I'd say, you spirit of fear. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. You have no authority in my life. You're a liar. Mm -hmm. And if this church makes it, it's because God says it's going to make it. And if it closes down, it's because God wants it to close down. But you don't have any say so. That's right. That's and I right. command you to lift off of me and be gone. You lying, foul spirit. Be gone in the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I prayed that way a couple of times through, maybe two minutes, three minutes. And that fear just lifted off. Mm -hmm. And uh, see, if we let negative emotions rule us, they become self-fulfilling prophecies. Wow. So uh, mm. every, every Sunday morning at 7 a.m., that same demon would hit me with the same <laughs> lie. <laughs> For one month, two months, three months, four months, seven months, eight months, 12 months, for 18 months, a year and a half, wow. the same lie. Wow. And I rebuked it the same and it lifted off the same and never stayed on me. That's right. And uh, and now it visits me a once a quarter because demons have a job to do. 
Sure. Uh, they're union demons, so they, <laughs> <laughs> they got to make the rounds. And so the demon comes, you know, still comes to me now. Mm. Says, you know, you're not going to make it. And, you know, after almost 37 years, you kind of go, well, okay. <laughs> really? You're, you're kind yeah. of a joke now, really. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I rebuke it and sometimes I just ignore it mm. for the lie that it is. And uh, I said, uh, I said, you're a lie from the pit of hell. And you have no authority in my life. See, and we can give it authority, but we don't have to. Anyway, uh, the Lord is the Lord was so gracious. And anything I say that, uh, you know, is talking about God's victories in my church's life and my life. I just want to be care, careful to say that he receives all the glory. Amen. He receives the glory. And I learned the word glory means value. Mm. So when you talk about the glory of God, you're talking about the value of God. Mm. When you're talking about his glory in your life, you're talking about his value in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything that God uses us for, and maybe we can talk uh, about the churches we built in the third world in the early 90s. Uh, we didn't, we had them, we paid for them to be built, actually what happened. But we've got, uh, in those days, 32 churches that we had built wow, in 11 yeah. countries. But he receives all the glory. Yeah. Yeah. We don't touch the glory of God. That's he right. He gets it all. He does. Yeah. He does get all the glory. And I, I I hear the story of that the demon of fear coming to you and you press through. Yes. A year and a half. Most people, with, <laughs> which you and I have both been in the room with people and say, well, can you just pr lay hands on and lay hands on this person, let it be done. It's like, well, you know, uh, it doesn't always work like that. You know, some people want a quick fix right then and there, but you persevered for a year and a half. And through that perseverance, the, the impact of God's hand on your life has literally, literally gone around the world and God receives all the glory. Yes, he does. In that. Uh, and I just think to myself, as I hear your story, like, <clears throat> When the hard times come, because the hard times always come. They do. Am I going to press through or am I going to let this thing overtake me? I look at the end goal. And honestly, I look at your life, Pastor Madeline's life, and it brings inspiration and encouragement to me to say, you know what? They they have been the model. They've been the forerunner. And if they, if they could go through it, I could go through it too. And uh, God receives all the glory. I, lo I love Pastor Madeline too. I remember whenever me and my wife came out here several years ago to, to, and we, I sat down with you and I said, Pastor Dave, I think we're coming out here to Vegas to plant a church. And Pastor Madeline said, listen, if God is telling you to do it, come on in, come on in. And you said, I will be your biggest fan. And you have done just that. And so I love you, man. I appreciate you guys so incredibly much. Uh, if people want to get involved um, with your ministry, what you have going on, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, uh, just show up at service and say hi. We're a small church, neighborhood church. Mm -hmm. First service is at eight o'clock and it's about a one hour service. It's in the chapel and we're at 7570 Peaceway or Peaceway Christian Center if you want to look us up on on the internet. And uh, then the second service is for the people that got to sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in the main sanctuary and uh, that is at 1145 yeah and that's about an hour and 10 minute service and uh anyway i promised to preach the truth of the word uh yeah uh, a lot of pe a lot of pastors especially mega pastors mega church pastors they don't want to preach against anything uh, it, that the bible talks about as sin <laughs> that is that is accepted in our culture <laughs> but uh you know god stands against the homosexual lifestyle. God right, stands right. against abortion. Yep. That's right. God stands against people living together and outside of marriage. That's and right. Engaging in sexual relations outside of marriage, and and uh, God stands against witchcraft, which is par uh, running rampant now in our culture. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to throw in God stands against uh, rap music that degrades women. Yeah. That uses constant vulgarities. Mm. Now I, I don't spend a lot of time on these things, but I do spend time and I stand up for what the Bible teaches. And uh, a lot of pastors go, well, I, I'm not going to say anything about homosexuality because Jesus didn't say it, which is a cop out. That's a coward for a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it and I'm glad I said it. I'll yeah. say it again yeah. because you know what? And in, in, in the Old Testament, when it talks about all the sexual sins, includes homosexuality right next to bestiality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. It's, it's, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing to me. 
that they say they're not going to say anything about it because Jesus didn't have to didn't say anything about it, mm-hmm. which is a cowardly way of approaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know what? The reason Jesus didn't say anything about it is because it was settled. It was a settled and issue. Absolutely. Why talk about something that everybody already knows the answer to? Absolutely. Except some pastors don't have the courage to stand up and preach the whole counsel of God. That's right. And uh, that's being <clears throat> unloving to your people. Mm-hmm. As Mark Twain said, <laughs> it's uh, what you know, what you don't know is not what's going to hurt you as much as what you do know that ain't so. Mm, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And you know, you do you you preach. You know, I've uh, before our church moved our services from Sunday night to Sunday morning. I came over with you guys a couple times and led worship with you guys. And, yes, and just worship with you guys. I love being in the building. It reminds me of my childhood being there, and. You still got it, Pastor Dave. <laughs> you still got it. Yes, sir. I was sitting there hearing you preach. I said, Pastor Dave still still has got this thing, man. Well, you're being very kind. I appreciate it. I, I just remember that I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an account for what I say and don't yep. say. It's true. Um, as a pastor, I'm going to give a double accounting. That's very and, true. And uh, I'm not going to have to answer for people that followed my preaching and that did not, you know, uh, did not get the truth. They're going to yeah. get the truth. Yeah. I'm not called to be their friend. I'm called to be their pastor. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's right. Well, Pastor Dave, thank you so incredibly much for being here on the show today. It's been an awesome honor and a real blessing. I wish we had more time to have you on, man. But thank you so much for being here. Well, my pleasure, brother. And uh, I just want to say I'm so proud of you and the church that you started here. Uh It is, the name of it is? Overflow. Overflow. Mm -hmm. I almost said rot, what God hath wrought. (laughs) But overflow, man, it was, uh, you've done such a great job. Let's see, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be two years here in February? Uh, Two years in February, yes, sir. So, wow, man, Uh, the numbers you're running in your services are fantastic. Uh, the people of God have stepped up with support financially, and mm. I just couldn't be prouder of you. And, you know, I told you, I told you I'd welcome you to, if you came, and I have. You sure have. But I right. told you try not to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're here because God has called you. Amen. Amen. And uh, may you always remember that it's his calling. Amen. And that means he qualified you. And that means he's going to support you. Amen. And uh, when he calls us, he qualifies us. Amen. So God bless you for your church. And uh, I'm so proud of you. You've done such a great job. Thanks, Pastor. I appreciate it. Amen. And listen, I want to thank you for joining us right here at Las Vegas United. You are a blessing to us. And we will see you right here next time on Las Vegas United. God bless you. Our show is hosted by Pastor Aaron Pino of Overflow Church. To learn more about him and his ministry, please visit overflowchurch.co. The guest this week is Pastor David L. Childers of Peaceway Christian Center. For more information, search Peaceway Christian Center in Las Vegas. For more information about CTN Vegas, visit ctnvegas.com.